Hi everyone, and welcome back to the Retro Shack. I'm back, baby! Here at The Shack, we'd like to give a huge thank you to the sponsor for this video, PCB Way. They help us out with all of our PCB fabrication needs and make fantastic boards at amazingly competitive prices. And it's not only PCBs that are on the menu. Apart from other fabrication services like CNC machining, 3D printing, sheet metal fabrication and injection moulding, PCB Way also have a great projects library of cool stuff to build from people all around the world. Oh, and if you don't like waving a soldering iron about, they can even assemble your PCBs for you. That's the PCB way. Right, on with the show. So what have I been up to? I can hear you shouting at the screen. You've been away for ages. Well, yes. And if you've watched the little video I did a couple of weeks ago, which is up here on the screen somewhere, you'll know that Mrs. Retro Shack and I have been turning the pages in our book of life and are heading into a new chapter, which is quite a poetic way of saying that we've sold our house and we're going to be a bit over here and a bit over there for a while. Anywho, things are settling down now and I'm starting to get most of my stuff into the places where it needs to be. But in the meantime, I thought, what can I do that needs no tools and might be vaguely interesting? Vaguely interesting being the benchmark I set for the channel and that I hopefully sometimes achieve. So I got hold of one of these Book 8088 in quotes retro laptops, a modern form factor for what is effectively an IBM PC 5150 and decided to see if I could find a reason it exists. OK, so before we get stuck into the unit itself, let's take a look at the component parts that make up the whole. Let's start with the brains and the thing that gives this device its name, the Intel 8088 or the 8088 CPU, introduced to the world in 1979. It's a variant of the earlier 8086 and is differentiated by only having an 8-bit external data bus instead of the 16-bit bus on its older stablemate. This made it attractive in two ways. First, it was slightly cheaper. And second, it had the words don't panic in large friendly letters on the casing. OK, it didn't say that, but it was cheaper and went on to be used extensively by a little known company in their tiny slice of computing history, IBM and their so-called PC. So really what we've got in here is the same chip that launched the IBM PC revolution. Only it isn't because what's actually in this 8088 book is an NEC V20, which is a pin and opcode compatible CPU produced by NEC and heavily scrutinized by Intel because it was very, very similar, resulting in two who's been a naughty boy sessions. And in those two cases, the first was settled out of court and the other found in NEC's favor. So there you go, right off the bat, this is actually a V20 book. For memory, we've got 640K and that's your lot. So that will provide a limit to what can be done on this machine. But remember, it's often stated that Bill Gates said 640K should be enough for anyone. Although the accuracy and validity of that quote is an episode all of its own. For sound, we've got the standard PC beeper, but it also comes with a Yamaha OPL3 sound card for ad lib compatibility. So FM, but no digital sound here. The inclusion of the OPL3 is a little anachronistic in that we now have a span of 11 years between the CPU from 1979 and OPL3 released in 1990, although OPL2 was around in 85 and the original OPL started life in 84. We're also sporting a Cirrus Logic VGA graphics card running at a whopping 86 megahertz and having 512K of memory, giving compatibility to the VGA standard from 1987 and giving a resolution of 640 by 480 and 256 colors. The card also supports the older EGA graphics and even CGA should you feel the need for purple in your life. So 
that gives us a little sweet spot of around 1987, where hopefully the CPU at 4.77 megahertz, or perhaps its turbo mode of 8 megahertz, will be fast enough to drive software that can also take advantage of the VGA graphics and ad lib sound, and all within that 640k of memory. Oh, and there's also a slot here to pop in an 8087 floating point unit, you know, if you're a power user. Connectivity wise, this version 2 model brings serial and parallel ports to join the existing compact flash slot and a USB port, which kind of isn't really, because although you can plug in external storage, which the integrated XT to IDE interface will recognize as a separate drive, just like it does with the compact flash drive, you can't use the USB port for anything else, such as mice or keyboards. There's an expansion port on the back, which allows you to plug in this expansion board, which in turn allows the connection of legacy 8-bit expansion cards. All of mine are in storage, so we'll ignore that bit for this episode and just assume that works until I can give it a good test. The screen is, well, it works, it's not great, and you can't adjust the brightness, colour, contrast, etc. But it's bright enough, colourful enough, and I guess that's okay. The keyboard, however, is annoying in that it's so close to being really nice. It's only for the fact that the keys are a bit wobbly and imprecise that means it just falls short and into the rating of usable. Size-wise, it's about yay long and yay high, and it doesn't really matter because it's too big to fit in a pocket, so if you've got one, just know it'll fit in any laptop case, briefcase or backpack. I'm not at all sure why, but the case is made of this dark smoked plastic, which allows you to kind of see inside, but I'm not sure why you need to. The plastic is transparent enough to make out that there are things to see, but so dark that you can't really make out the things that you might want to look at, like perhaps the retro chips. There are these little trap doors that allow you to see and access the CPU, FPU and BIOS and the OPL3 sound card. So again, no real need for the slightly transparent case. I don't like all these stickers it comes with. They don't even represent what's actually inside. It says color graphics adapter here, but we've got VGA inside. And here it's proudly showing an 8088 CPU, but we've got an NEC V20. At least the DOS sticker is accurate. On the bottom, there are more trapdoors, one to access the VGA graphics card and another that lets you get to the battery, which isn't glued in and has a standard connector, so I guess you could carry a spare if you really wanted an extended session. Right, what's it like to use? Well, first of all, we have to give a little nod to Sergei Kisilev, whose BIOS forms the basis for the machine. Unfortunately, in a pirated form, effectively removing credit for his work and also removing code not specific to this device. So I'll be swapping that out myself as soon as I locate my Mini Pro EEPROM programmer. Doing that will not only mean this device can step down from the naughty step, but it will benefit from some core improvements too. The new BIOS has been optimized for the NEC V20 chip and disk transfer speeds will apparently almost double. Now, Apologies, but there's no way to capture the screen other than with a camera as there are no external video outputs. Booting up the machine, there's that tug of nostalgia from seeing DOS booting up and issuing the DIR command, we get this little pause, which is nothing more than the machine calculating the amount of free space left on the disk. But then again, this disk is much larger than most disks were at the time, so we can forgive it a little pause. Typing VER, we can see that we've got DOS version 6.22, the last official standalone version of DOS that Microsoft released in June of 1994, again widening the timeline of component parts to 15 years, 1979 to 1994. Before we dive in any deeper, let's turn on turbo mode using function F6 to get our whopping 8 megahertz, and then we'll see what's available out of the box. There are a few programs installed by default, so let's run the QA Plus Advanced Diagnostics and see what it reports. And it's saying we've got V20 Intel, which is kind of right, 639K of base memory, 
no expanded memory, and it's reporting the 64K of ROM as extended memory, of which we can see that the current BIOS occupies just under 32K, if I'm reading that right. We've got VGA color, 500 meg hard disk, and all appears to be in order. So let's test out a couple of games that came pre-installed. Firstly, Arkanoid. So we get the option of CGA or EGA, no VGA here. Let's select keyboard controls and well, it's a perfectly playable version of Arkanoid, but it's not really pushing or showcasing the machine. Okay, so I've gotten hold of a copy of Starcon, which has both VGA graphics and ad lib support. Let's see how that works. Well, we have a nice VGA intro screen, along with some funky ad lib music. So it looks nice and sounds nice, but can you play it? Well, yes, but it is slow, and this is in turbo 8 megahertz mode. So let's try something less action-y, Lemmings. And here we might see a sweet spot, VGA graphics, ad lib sound, acceptable speed, and I think that's always going to be the problem here. It's a system with compromise at every corner. If you target CPU speed as the important piece, you'll need to compromise on graphics quality. If you target VGA graphics, you'll be compromising speed. Want to run business apps or anything a little demanding and you'll likely hit memory limits. Okay, let's take this little thing apart and see what it's rocking on the inside, other than the bits we can nearly see from the outside. Well, inside there's not really much to see apart from the mainboard, which essentially bungs all of the other parts of a PC into a CPLD device. I guess in one way that means there's less to go wrong and some flexibility in what the machine can do in the future within the boundaries of the old tech that forms the core of the machine. But for all of its faults, I do kind of love it. Would I suggest you buy it? Well, not at the $230 plus they go for on eBay, definitely not. This one from AliExpress was around the $160 mark, but when you consider you can get a decent 386 or even 486 laptop from Fleabay for around the same money, I think I'd recommend doing that instead and having a machine where all the parts are of the same era. Drop your comments below. We always love to read them. Have you got one of these? Do you think it's a worthwhile machine to own? What improvements do you think the designers should put into the next version, presuming they do one? Right, that's it for this episode. I'm glad to be back. And until next time in the shack, goodbye from me.